Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Oljik Andrasek. I've been asked to uh, moderate this session. And um, first little comment I'll make, because I've been asked to make a few comments, is that I'm very happy to see that this uh, panel is very well gender balanced. And so I do a bit of um, uh, counterbalance to all the French we've been hearing. I will speak to you in English. Um, before starting, uh, I really have to say this uh, from the deepness of my heart. I've spent maybe 5% of my life in conferences, which is no great honor. But um, it, it has been, most of the time, quite boring. And uh, this session, this conference, for me, uh, I cannot but say that it's been amazing, informative, and especially this morning, finally a little bit controversial and uh, giving uh, not only the party line, so to say, but raising the difficult questions that governments are faced uh, in the area of people on the move, migrants, refugees, and especially, of course, children who get caught up in this very involuntarily. If the parents move voluntarily or involuntarily, the kids don't have much to say about that. So in that context, um, uh, I think I should underline definitely that uh, congratulations to the Czech presidency and congratulations um, um, uh, to the Council of Europe of supporting this idea to bring up such a delicate, such a controversial and difficult subject in this period of time for Europe. So really the courage of uh, the Czech presidency to put this conference together, I think, has to be sort of acknowledged. Second, uh, I'd like to bring us back to the very first few words that came from the podium. The minister himself found the time, and uh, I was very impressed that, uh, untypically for a minister, he didn't give us a speech, a party line, but he reminded us uh, of what we do tend to forget sometimes, that migration, refugees, unfortunately in human history, are a phenomenon that uh, we are all a product of in many respects. And that we should never forget that many of our families maybe would not have had the children and us sitting in this room if there was not a possibility to flee war, persecution, or total poverty, as some people uh, face in the world. Uh, third, I think with this sort of thinking coming directly from a minister, uh, I would like to really congratulate the staff of his ministry who have done a fantastic job in preparing a conference which is high-tech, which is warm, uh, which is working like Swiss, Swiss clockwork, which is not typical in the Czech Republic, I'm Czech, so I can say. Um, I'm, I'm amazed uh, what a conference the staff have put together and how they've been taking care of us and giving us the... Uh... <clears throat> and uh, thank you for the lovely tie you gave me, um, because even though I, I have it in my pocket, it just doesn't suit my, my shirt today, but I love, the, I love the tie that I got for the conference. Uh, anyway, um, we're all supposed to be brief, but also uh, we're supposed to really touch the issues and, and collect some genuine, um, in this session, we're going to be trying to highlight some genuine alternatives, good practices, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, I'm very glad that in this session we'll have not only a European perspective, because the tension is a worldwide problem, and we have a speaker uh, also not from Europe. Um, but I wanted to mention some of the paradoxes I haven't heard about, and I don't want to start a debate on it, but I think in the back of our minds, I have spent tw maybe 20 out of the 30 years dealing with border guards and, and uh, uh, migration police and detention centers and extradition, pre-detention for extradition purposes of um, uh, people to other countries sought by Interpol. So. Uh, 
the paradoxes that we face, I think um, uh, one of them from the last session, one paradox I'm very acutely aware of, every government, every ministry doesn't have, seem to have a problem building more prisons and getting more barbed wire, if I put it this way. Um, and this to aim also at UNHCR, our budgets, to be very honest, and I've been responsible for budgets in many countries. Um, when we have a budget cut, honestly, the first thing we cut is um, children playgrounds, paper for children, um, pens and pencils, support to NGOs, which do the work which is not considered the highest priority. But somehow for um, detention, there always seems to be money to build new detention centers. Uh, so that's, I find, as a paradox. Uh, if we could maybe, with this conference, make a difference in having funding better also for alternatives of detention, it would be very good. Um, I am also uh, like to underline this paradox. I really haven't found a case, and in this very learned um, assembly of professors and practitioners and lawyers, I haven't heard anybody say that detaining a child somehow can be equated or justified with the be best interest of the uh, child. And every single state that re is represented here, except I think Somalia and the United States in the world, have signed a children's convention. And the best interest of the child does not seem to me, and this is a paradox, um, the tension doesn't fit from that point of view at all. Um, I also uh, have not heard anything about Article 31 of the Convention of um, uh, Ref Refugee Convention, which actually uh, says we do not penalize and punish refugees. But of course, I'm acutely aware of all the problems, direct entry, the person shouldn't lose time in applying for asylum, etc. But refugees generally, if we talk just about refugees, whether it's persecution for them, new persecution to sit in a detention center or not, uh, maybe we may differ on that, but every time I've met a refugee, they feel they're being punished. They are being punished for, being, uh, for seeking asylum. And not all of them, we know, seek asylum for the right reasons. Um, yesterday's presentations were very interesting for me. If I sum it up, we are trying to square a circle. But I still hope that we will be able to square that circle somehow. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, I have not heard governments say from their point of view, and maybe we'll hear it today, how difficult it is for a border guard in a forest when he detains a bunch of people, evidently violating the law of the land. Uh, uh, what to do with these people and how to deal with them with the limited financial resources, with the time um, uh, constraints. One aspect which has fascinated me always has been that um, UNHCR gets accused of aiding and abetting, I hope the translators can keep up with this, aiding and abetting illegal migration. Why? Because in the countries I've served, most of them have um, had a border with the EU, and the border guards are protecting the EU. Of a non-EU non country is protecting EU countries. That's their job. And what they do is, when they catch somebody crossing the border illegally, obviously with smugglers leading them, they detain these people, and then they keep them incomunicado for one week, two weeks, three weeks. No social worker, no lawyer, because they are investigating a crime crossing the border. And in this period, people are kept incomunicado, and the impact on children is enormous, of course. And in this situation, UNHCR, if we get to hear about the case, an NGO, if it gets to hear about the case, um, efforts are made to get the children out of that detention. And the moment we do that, those children within one week are gone because they have the phone number, they have the instructions, and they know, for better or for worse, the smuggler provides them a better solution than the government that caught them. And to be very honest, they don't trust UNHCR at all that we can provide a solution for them either. So they, they, they're released, and off they go again. Um, 
so much for uh, the paradoxes. Yesterday we heard much about norms, jurisprudence, the real impact of the policies on children. I really hope that our panel, which is distinguished, and I'll give the first word to Antigone Angelaki, uh, will give us some of the uh, alternatives, the positive uh, things that could be done by states in this situation. Antigone has, um, I see here, uh, worked with community interpretation, big issue, because a lot of asylum seekers cannot communicate with the police who detain them, and the first reception rights of unaccompanied minors. So please, I, I give the floor um, to Antigone. Um, I would first of all like to uh, warmly thank the organizers for the invitation and for this really well-organized conference and for the super privileged time slot right after coffee break and before lunch break. Um, so I will start my presentation with uh, an introduction about Metadrasi, what we do, who we are. I will continue with um, the different steps that are followed by an accompanied minor until he gets to an accommodation facility for children. And what are the challenges faced that lead to detention or pro prolonged detention? And in this respect, what are the activities developed uh, by Matadrasi in order to cope with these challenges? Um, and then, if I have enough time, I will uh, talk about some lessons learned and share with you some uh, food for thought. So, Metadras is an NGO that was established in uh, late 2009 in order to cover gaps in the field of migration management in Greece. Uh, the idea was to do things that nobody else was touching. We started with community interpreting. Uh, Greece had been accused for many years of not having efficient or effective or even existent uh, community interpreting in the context of its asylum procedures, first reception procedures, etc. In the course of, this, of these uh, seven years, we have developed a pool of uh, more than 600 interpreters in 35 languages and dialects. Uh, in which we cover interpretation services in the context of the asylum procedure, first reception, provision of information by UNHCR or other international organizations, and a variety of other different contexts. Um, we also provide legal aid in the islands of the Northeast Aegean. Uh, the gap that we covered in this respect was uh, the local establishment of lawyers in the islands where they could intervene to the authorities, have a permanent presence, and follow up the, the situation very closely. Um, another activity relating to integration was uh, Greek language courses. And then uh, the activities which I will uh, develop more in my presentation are the safety net that we have developed for unaccompanied children, starting from escorting missions, um, a guardianship scheme which I, uh, on which I will expand more, foster care, and five transit accommodation facilities. Now let's start with um, the necessary steps for uh, the support, for the provision of support uh, to unaccompanied and separated children in Greece. So first of all, as in most countries, children have to be identified, first of all, as children, so below the age of 18, and second of all, as unaccompanied. This has been a challenge because, you know, in the context of a hotspot, there's always someone that uh, appears as an uncle or a family friend or someone who says that he accompanies, he or she accompanies the child. Um, the second uh, step, of course, is registration. Then, usually, child are placed under protective custody, which, in fact, is detention until they are transferred to an accommodation facility, which is an open shelter for children. Now, uh, before that step, uh, free space in accommodation facilities has to be identified and available. Before transfer to, uh, to the accommodation facilities, the, the minors are requested to complete certain medical exams. Uh, and then, if the exams are ready and the facility, uh, there's, a, there's an open space in one of the facilities, then the children are escorted to that accommodation. <clears throat> now, some of the challenges in this procedure, in the Greek context, uh, were the following. 
the first one that we dealt with was the lack or unwillingness of staff or the unavailability of resources in order to escort the children. So this sounds very simple. You know, you have a child in a detention center and somebody has to transfer them to the shelter. It might be, you know, a three-hour drive, a five-hour drive, a 10-hour trip with a boat from the islands to the mainland. It sounds simple, but uh, for many years it was um, the public larks from the regions or the municipalities did not want to undertake this risk because the child might abscond, the child might be approached by smugglers, and then they are the ones with the responsibility. So what we did is that we uh, developed this network of uh, escorting teams that accompany children within 48 hours from the time that we receive the request from any location uh, of Greece, usually it's the islands, uh, to, uh, to the Greek mainlands where, where the majority of uh, facilities for children are placed. Now, another challenge has been the high volume of beneficiaries uh, in hospitals, so that would lead to the medical exams taking too long to complete. So children would remain in detention because the, they didn't have their medical exams ready and they, didn't, they could not access the hospital. In this respect, we established transit accommodation facilities for children in, um, in Samos, Hios and Lesbos. There are three islands of the five where the hotspots are. Um, now, another problem was the lack of constant follow-up necessary for the completion of all required procedures, be it the, the transfer to a permanent shelter, be it the asylum procedure, family reunification procedures, relocation, etc. For this reason, we developed a guardianship network for unaccompanied minors, on which I will expand more. It's not guardianship in the strict legal sense, but we cover 80% uh, of the activities that the legal guardian should be undertaking. Um, and then the other challenge that Greece is faced with is that there are not enough free spaces in permanent accommodation facilities. There are not enough spaces, basically. Right now, we have more than 2,000 unaccompanied children uh, on the waiting list. And um, the, it seems that there will never be enough space, to be honest. So um, what we suggested in this, in this respect, so that pe children will not have to wait in detention while, um, while a space is identified, are the transit accommodation facilities and a, fast, a foster family scheme for the younger children. So in the context of our escorting missions since 2011, we have escorted more than uh, 5,850 unaccompanied and se separated children to uh, permanent accommodation centers around Greece in the context of more than 1,800 missions. We have established these transit accommodation facilities um, in the three in the islands uh, that are mainly dealt with the newcomers, Lesbos, Samos, and Chios. And uh, we have established two transit facilities in Athens and Thessaloniki that um, are used as transit shelters before children uh, go into foster families. Now, regarding the guardianship network, uh, I would say that guardianship is not uh, an alternative to detention per se. It's not enough. Uh, in Greece, we have a system, as explained yesterday, that is uh, basically more uh, streamed towards uh, and described towards the needs of Greek children. So uh, a guardian, in terms of responsibility, equals a parent. Uh, according to the law, it's the public prosecutor that, that is the guardian. So we have developed an alternative system where we receive authorizations on behalf of the public prosecutor so that the children enjoy a number of rights. So we enroll them to school, we make sure they are registered, we make sure they go through the asylum procedure and support them in this respect. Um, 
we make sure they have access to healthcare. And this, this is what has been undertaken by our now 53 members of the guardianship network that are deployed all around the Greek territory. So far, they have assisted uh, the cases of 2,067 minors, most of whom are boys and uh, girls to, uh, to a lesser extent. And through, uh, and I need to, I need to um, recognize the support, the very significant support of uh, the Netherlands and NIDOS in this respect, in, uh, in the development of this system of, uh, of guardianship, which then led to, to the idea of developing also a foster family scheme. Uh, the idea is to host children in families of um, similar ethnic background or at least linguistic background. And that was the idea in principle, but then we, we saw that there are many practical difficulties, such as the fact that you know, families might not have this extra room that is required to, uh, to host a child. So we tried with Greek families, and it has really been a success. Even, even, even though they don't speak the same language, it has really seemed to be efficient and effective, and the children, and the families uh, develop this way of communication, it really, it's a, it's a matter of hours. Uh, so far, we have managed to, uh, to place 35 children in foster families. Now, uh, what are the lessons that we have learned through the, the development uh, of all these activities? We can see that you know, I mean, and I'm sure you already know this, that children go through a lot in order to reach any destination. Greek might, Greece might be the first destination uh, in Europe. They go through a lot, but it seems that they are further traumatized and a lot more traumatized than having to wait for these lengthy uh, family reunification procedures, relocation procedures. They, they uh, go under a lot of stress while awaiting a decision on or when their trust will, will be taking place. So I don't know, do we really want to be responsible for creating this extra trauma to children that are already traumatized? Um, now, another lesson learned on, on our behalf is that should civil society wait for states to undertake action? In our opinion, no, no. We should act to the benefit of children and assist the state rather than denouncing the fact that they, they are not acting, that they are not able to do anything. Uh, in our opinion, it's better to act to maybe establish a parallel system, maybe, but it's something that works to the benefit of children. Um, a third lesson would be that European solidarity should and has been, in some cases, demonstrated in practice. So, you know, it's, it's not enough to have all these beautiful conferences where we all talk about how it's, you know, not good to detain children and, and draft laws and guidelines and, uh, you know, um, opinions about how children should not be detained. We should see that in practice. We should see, you know, budgets approved for the creation of alternatives. This is a really, you know, substantial way in which states can show their commitment in this respect. Another case is uh, the example of Portugal. We have managed to, uh, to send uh, five children of Afghan origin uh, through the use of Article 17 of the Dublin Regulation to Portugal. You know, Portugal did not have any obligation to take them, but it did show this, this type of solidarity through, um, through this activity. Now, I'm moving to some food for thought. Especially regarding the Greek case, um, do we think that the increase in accommodation places will resolve the problem? I don't think so. Even now that the flows in Greece have relatively decreased in 2017, not taking into consideration the last month, which has not been the case, the number of unaccompanied minors uh, arriving is actually rising. Um, so, we have some suggestions. One would be the creation of a European accommodation scheme. You know, why not say who has free accommodation places in all around Europe than just seeing who has free accommodation places in Greece? That has not enough. 
and transfer children immediately, not having to wait to detention, not having to wait for the reunification or relocation procedures, etc. cetera. Um, another, uh, another idea would be the establishment of a European network for guardianship, so that somebody, you know, that guardians are very well connected and can follow up the cases even when the children leave uh, their country. And the other would be um, the, the active seeking of solutions and the support for solutions for the transfer of children outside maybe the family reunification procedures or outside the relocation procedures, such as um, mentioned yesterday by uh, Citizen UK in the Safe Passage Project. So this would be it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Antigone, for walking us through um, a very thoughtful and evidently uh, well-designed project into which you and your colleagues have put a lot of effort and care. It's impressive, 5,850 escorted children. I don't know what the total number of children has gone through Greece, but it's probably a fraction still, but um, good for that. I, what it gets me to think of is what you're actually doing is supplementing what could or should be doing, done by the government, which for very, various reasons, good and bad, probably cannot be done. Funding probably is one of them. And uh, I thank you also, I think, on behalf of everybody to think forward in some suggestions what could be done, because evidently this problem doesn't look like it's going to go away. Um, our second speaker will be uh, from Mexico. I, I must say that um, when I checked the statistics on Mexico, 200,000 detained, uh, 40,000 of them are children, and 10% have alternatives. So do your maths. In that connection, I would like to say that Hector Hugo has been working in the uh, Mexican government in the area of migration since 2001. I'm amazed that after 16 years he still has black hair because I worked in UNHCR five years and I, I, I turned gray. <laughs> but um, Hector, please uh, take the podium. We're looking forward to hearing to you, from you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Thank you for the organizers. It's um, extraordinary uh, work. Thank you very much for the IDC for this invitation. And thank you very much for uh, one of us to give me this opportunity to, to tell you some good news from Mexico. Somebody said yesterday that uh, it's quite easy to establish uh, standards. The real challenge is to implement these standards. And this is the, a, a little part of the Mexican story of trying to implement these standards. I will try to expose uh, uh, good practices um, make a reality with uh, the companion of uh, IDC and uh, the impacts of these good practices. I will try to, to contextualize. In the summer of uh, 2014, there was a significant increase in the flow of children and adolescent migrants through Mexico. This increase known as the crisis of the migrant children, produce multiple reactions in the region that would case, cause a change in the way in which migrant children and adolescents is conceived in Mexico. The impact of this crisis crystallized in an action initiated by the social sector, sectors involved in the issue and finally in the renewal of their primordial aspects of Mexican policy on children. The importance of this historical moment was that with the increased 
in the number of minors detected by the immigration authorities in Mexico, the need for a more robust uh, uh, protection system became evident. In the original text of the Migration Act published in 2011, migrant minors are seen as subjects of rights who are also considered to be vulnerable and need special attention. It was soon evident that there was a need to consider the most important demand, non-detention of children and adolescents in migratory stations. An adaptation to Article 112 of this law focuses on the necessity by establishing the obligation to accommodate unaccompanied minors in facilities of the integral family development system and the possibility of establishing private assistance centers for those cases in which there would be no possibility of housing the children in a public assistance center. However, the inability of protection system to accommodate the growing number of migrant minors detected by immigration authorities would be evident. The few places where migrant minors could be accommodated have been the main obstacle to complying the law mandates, especially since public assistance centers are mostly administrated by state and municipal protection system, and few of them provide for the care of children and adolescents in situation of migration. However, Institutional weakness, ranging from material issues to the lack of specialized personnel providing professional assistance to the needs of minors in a mobility situation, were also evident. On the other hand, private assistance centers that had the vocation to house migrant children were not sufficient, and in the majority of cases, refused to provide the necessary assistance on the grounds of lack of resources and the existence of profiles that migrant minors should be adjusted. The consequence was that the minors detected by the migratory authorities had to remain in the migratory station because there were not immediately places for their accommodations. This does not mean, however, that all migrant minors have remained in migratory station. On the contrary, significant efforts were made, both by, by public assistance centers and by private assistance centers, especially in the states with the largest influx of migrants, in the states located in the Gulf route of Mexico, particularly Chiapas, Tabasco, Veracruz, uh, Ciudad de Mexico, San Luis Potosí, um, Tamaulipas, and uh, Nuevo León. These efforts would result in the creation of a support network which resolved the, pro the problem at the moment, but did not provide any certainty in the field of the institutionality. In early 2015, IDC proposed to the National Institute of Immigration through its uh, Citizens Council the implementation of a pilot program to establish a mechanism to accommodate migrant children in private assistance centers com combined by IDC to collaborate with the Central Immigration Authority by providing a limited number of accommodation spaces, mainly for children and adolescents who had the possibility of being integrated into Mexican society. The proposal consisted of 30 spaces arranged in two institutions, Casa Alianza and Aldeas Infantiles SOS. Both institutions agreed to accommodate in their facilities the migrant children that multidisciplinary teams detected in scheduled visits to the migratory stations. The model had two problems. One, the proposal did not consider that the immigration authority gives priority to the resolution of the administrative procedures established to minors and the low presence and the staff 
of both institutions did not allow the minors to be sent to the shelters immediately, and two, the integration of the majority of migrant minors was not effective because their main interest was to leave the migratory stations to continue their journeys. The answer was, for the first topic, that it was the immigration authority who detected the potential candidates because of their contact with uh, minors, and for the second topic, to apply the benefit to migrant minors who were applying for asylum, which warranted the possibilities of integration but involved the intervention of an additional actor, the Mexican Commission for Assistance to Refugees. With these adaptations, the program registered positive results, providing almost immediate accommodation for the children and generating ample possibilities for, of integration for the beneficiaries. A total of 30 minor migrants were housed, most of, the, of whom, whom obtained regular status in Mexico and made progress in the process of their effective integration into Mexican society. The implementation of this pilot produced high levels, levels of approval by members of the Citizens, Citizens Council and other agencies, which allowed the construction of communication channels between the government and several actors and established the basis for the implementation of another pilot program that would conclude with the institution, institutionalization of the program of the alternative to detention for asylum seekers, adults, and families, in coordination with uh, the COMAR and the UNHCR, that between July 2016 and September 2017 has benefited more than 1,600 people. The lesson learned have been many. Uh, but uh, perhaps the, the most important are, one, governments, international organizations, and civil society must recognize that the implementation of durable solutions cannot be carried out in isolation. It is necessary to coordinate and articulate efforts. Two, as long as there are no clear procedures, with clearly defined roles and objectives, the response of the challenge, challenges will remain reactive, ineffective, and ephemeral. Three, the articulation of efforts between actors is fundamental to reach international standards, and trust between actors is essential. The process of implementing the general law of the, uh, on the rights of children and adolescents and its regulation did not allow the continuity of pilot program, but allowed the intervention of new actors. In order to the, um, the creation of system, uh, it ordered the creation of integral system for the protection of children and adolescents um, Sistema Integral de Protección a Niñas, Niños y Adolescentes, uh, as well known as uh, CIPINA, at uh, federal, state, and municipal levels, whose role is to coordinate efforts among authorities responsible for protecting children, including migrant minors. Its main feature is to be chaired by the heads of executive powers at all levels of government. It ordered to the creation of the offices for, for protection of children and adolescents at the three levels of government. Nowadays, more than 4,000 offices have been created to deal with aspects such as protection measures, restitution plans, and legal representation among other actors. Actions. The determination of where each migrant minor should be housed rests with these instances. Specific roles were provided to the public social assistance centers, instructing the obligation to accommodate the migrant children and open it wide the possibilities for the participation in the action of international organizations and NGOs. This is intended to ensure the minors in general and migrant minors 
in particular are afforded the widest possible protection and that uh, at all times the best interest of children. In order to collaborate in the process of implementing these normative bodies, the National Institute of Immigration combined the Interagency Committee for the Implementation of the General Law on the Rights of Children and Adolescents in Migratory Aspects, whose main function is to coordinate actions to guarantee the rights for migrants' children, include, include, including non-detention. The emphasis of this group has been to strengthen the world for, of protection in the entities with the highest flow of migrant children through an accompanying work focusing in primarily in two issues. One, strengthen the capacity of institutions to guarantee the accommodation and care of uh, migrant children. Two, to develop the, capa the capacities of interinstitutional coordination. In addition to the Institute, participates in this group the Integral System of the Protection of Children and Adolescents, the Federal Office of the Protection of Children and Adolescents, the Mexican Commission for Assistance to Refugees, the Secretariat for Social Development, and the System for Integra Integral Development of the Family in Mexico City. At the moment, attention is focused on the articulation of effort at the central level and uh, on the reproduction of these models or of coordination in states where the implementation of the law of children and adolescents has not been fully implemented. We know that they reach the main goal, we must go a long way, but uh, we also know that doing it together can do it. The budget issue remains an obstacle. It is, of course, when uh, we talk about uh, 40,000 children and adolescents detected by immigration forces every year, 20,000 of them traveling alone. That is why the group promotes initiatives so that the instance of protection receive more resources and for civil society organizations to obtain public resources in support of the work they develop in collaboration, in collaboration with the government. In our reflection, we have reached other uh, conclusions. For example, the solution is not only the responsibility of Mexico, that is why we have promoted the concept of shared responsibility, understanding that the real solution is regional, rather than local. The goal, uh, with, the, uh, with this I, conclu uh, I conclude, is clear. Completely eliminate the detention of minor, regardless of legal status or administrative aspects. It is an ambitious goal that uh, we are sure we will achieve. I uh, hope very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hector. Uh, you started with challenges and you finished with challenges. And this um, ambition that you have is, um, I think, laudable and um, we're all in the same boat. If we're IGOs, NGOs, or governments, actually, if we're doing our job properly, I think you, you made that point very strongly, and I thank you for that. The shared responsibility, it's interesting. It's a big debate in Central Europe. Again, I don't want to set it up, but in Europe, Central Europe, Southern Europe, shared responsibility, it's interesting to see that in Mexico, um, you realize that also. Um, thank you very much. That was um, very good. We. Uh, pressed by time, please let's move on to our third speaker today. Our third speaker today um, is Irene Rittman from the Dutch um, government. Uh, you can read up more about her uh, in your papers, but what struck me, she was responsible for return matters, especially all forced, and then I lose the text. So. I haven't got more, but I suspect she was um, uh, responsible for forced returns. And I must say, chapeau, being responsible for that, that's one of the most difficult jobs that I've, I've ever encountered in, in, uh, in this area of work. 
uh, but I'm sure you're going, and then I've heard some rumors that you have been um, uh, instrumental in setting up, reducing budgets for detention uh, and increasing them for alternatives. And I think we've heard that um, uh, from the plenary a little bit before. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, I was responsible for return, uh, false returns and the alternatives to detention that's together in the Netherlands. And I'm not going to start very original. Uh, thank you for organizing this conference. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to present some of the alternatives uh, we have in the Netherlands to you. Uh, I want to go back because in the previous panel there was the question about uh, data requests. Um, in the Netherlands, we are trying to get to more open data. However, if you think we haven't uh, answered any questions, let us know, because most of our data is on the government website and that's updated biannually. Um, promising uh, alternatives to detention. Um, I'm going to take a slight detour to the Dutch asylum system because um, as many European countries, we have the right to reception. There is a reception agency and we have specialized locations for children uh, and also the foster care for what was mentioned earlier, needles. And needles is for us crucially uh, for the well-being of an unaccompanied minor. Uh, most of you may have heard of NIDOS, and it took us a long time to develop the relationship between NIDOS and the government. Uh, and what is fundamentally is that they are totally independent. They are truly there for the best interest of the child. Next to NIDOS, you always have the guard, uh, you have the lawyers, but that's separate. Um, NIDOS is the one that looks into uh, the benefits for the child. What does the child need? All right. Let me see. I will focus on the return because for the, uh, the asylum procedure is open in the Netherlands, that's for families and for unaccompanied minors, but for return uh, we had detention and we still have some form of detention. This is, uh, we have seven open family locations in the Netherlands, um, these, these are spread throughout the country and you can see at the picture this is what our buildings look like. Those are open family locations um, where you go as a family has uh, been denied their uh, asylum request. This is the one at Bergen, <laughs> it's uh, in Friesland in the Netherlands, and this is the one in Den Helder. So each location gives the family uh, the right to family life, but we do consider them freedom restricted. To be honest, um, my colleague and I were discussing it. We didn't consider them as an alternative. Uh, it was the CDH MIC group where I'm in and also the FRA report that made us realize that the rest of Europe saw this as an alternative. For us, it was reception uh, and it's a reception center. Um, but it is where we work on return to the families. And what's the freedom restriction? Uh, you have to stay within the municipality, but, as we Dutch do a lot, we do not control whether or not you leave the, uh, uh, the municipality. Have to move it? I'm sorry. Um, oh, now I can hear myself. This is strange. <laughs> All adults have a weekly duty to report at the location um, and um, all, that's why we call it a freedom restricted uh, location. And all the NGOs that work on return, but also work on alternatives, are active at those locations. We did have border detention for families with children uh, in t uh, until 2014, but that was for us one of the things that came back. Why do you have border detention for families with children, but you don't have border detention for unaccompanied minors? I think the question was raised yesterday also. And uh, together with UNHCR and the IDC, we developed a border screening. We took their documents and looked into what can we change. And as of uh, 2014, we don't have any um, uh, detention unless in the border screening it is turned out that either the family doesn't ha isn't really a family or there is a, a severe suspicion of uh, Article 1F of the UN Convention. 
This is the old detention center um, for families in Rotterdam. As you can see, that's a truly a detention facility. Um, we had some debate about this picture because it's, it's rather confronting. In September 2013, we, uh, the parliament received a letter from the ministry that no more family detention unless a family uh, had uh, absconded. For nine months, we didn't have any family detentions, but it didn't work. Um, Two-thirds of all families that got the notification of departure absconded, and the worst part was they did not show up back to the reception agency, to NGOs, to churches, to municipalities, or shelters. Nor did they come to other countries. And that raised the debate in the Netherlands what to do next. Oh, we went to uh, a lot of um, other countries um, and we looked into how is detention organized in those countries. And we didn't find anything we thought we can impl implement this in the Netherlands. And then there was this coalitions of NGOs and uh, institutions in the Netherlands, that including the Amnesty International, the Refugee Council, but also Defense for Children, and the Advisory Committee on Migration. The former chairperson is also here, uh, Ms. Adriana van Dooyewerd, and she will speak uh, in the afternoon. Uh, and they really helped us. Um, we learned that we didn't have to agree with them and they didn't have to agree with us, but we could learn from each other and that we were honest about what we wanted to reach and they could give us input on that. We do call it detention 2.0. I know yesterday there was a lot of comments about, well, you can't make it any child-friendly or something like that. We do call it that way. Uh, with the help of the Innovation uh, Institute in the Netherlands, the TNO, we made a new location. Now, what you see here is the picture of the building plans. And the idea was, like, we didn't want any barbed wire or anything, but we did want to show that it's a close location. And we do call it detention. It is detention. And this is the very last resort that we have. It's last resort measurement only for families for return with a maximum duration, um, but prefer to shorter stay. Unity of family is central. And education is available. Healthcare is available. And because it's also the location for the unaccompanied minors, specialized youth care is also available. It's a very small location. And this is one of the pictures uh, that we took before the opening. I don't have any pictures at the moment where, where it's in use. The pictures you will see next, uh, staff is uh, posing for the pictures because uh, we don't want to invade on the privacy of the people that are in the location. And that's one important thing. We do have visits to the location, but we try to leave the people as they are because it's um, intense enough that you are in a detention location. This is the permanent location. and um, We have uh, 12 houses for families. They're truly houses with three bedrooms, living room and everything. Uh, and we have an unaccompanied minor building and an activity center, but it's still detention. Staff is specialized in this location. They are not in uniform. They come from the reception agency as well. The custodial agency, they work together. And what was a very important change for us is that the detention measure is not imposed by the police. So families that will be placed into detention will be picked up by the repatriation service who is not in uniform, who's wearing normal clothes. It's a normal transport, no handcuffs or anything. So that's a specialized form of transportation to the detention center. This is for um, an example of the living room uh, and the kitchen of a family unit. And this is like the general building because we also have a building where uh, lawyers can meet, they can have visitors. Um, and we try to give it an open feel, um, still it's being closed. Now, next question of course is, okay, how many people do you have in detention? At the moment, there's approximately one family a week 
uh, in the location and one a month of the unaccompanied minors. So those are very small numbers, but we think it's worth to have this location. That also makes the costs very high, and I saw uh, just before there were questions on Slido about the costs for the alternatives. When we went down in our detention capacity, part of the money was reserved for a grant program for NGOs. And that's the choice we made, so there is a, um, approximately one million a year that's available for NGOs to um, ask for a subsidy or a grant and to look into uh, how can we help with alternatives to detention. Um, we also have a specialized building for the unaccompanied minors, and this is an example of the unaccompanied minor bedroom. Uh, they also have their own facilities, so their own room, but next to that they have a common living room and kitchen. <laughs> One of my colleagues is posing in that uh, picture. And we tried to, uh, we first thought, where can we put the unaccompanied minors? And we chosen for that to give it more of a family feel. So there, there are 10 unaccompanied minor bedrooms and they have their own living room and kitchen then, which they, um, where there's always staff of uh, our um, people available. Oh, I think I now ended it. It's not easy um, to have again detention. We had nine months where we didn't have any detention, and that's the ideal word. But we saw that we needed a form of detention uh, as last resort. That does give discussion because there is a form of detention, and even then, you will be faced with a lot of difficult questions about unity of family. Um, how do we go on with the returns? Because they are false returns. And that asks also a lot um, about the costs. Uh, I heard today a lot about um, that the numbers for the people who returned um, were higher under the alternatives than they were under detention. We never had that. Um, our alternatives, uh, the rate of success is very low. Um, in detention, maybe because that is our last resort, the numbers are very high. For families, we can only detain them if we have the travel documents, if we have um, the laissez passes. So we don't know for sure where this comes from, that for us the alternatives are uh, less successful than detention, but that's something that uh, we really want to look uh, further into. We started with the alternatives for everyone in the Netherlands, um, well, every migrant in the Netherlands as of 2013, and we are now working with the University of Nijmegen on a way to evaluate that uh, using some of the um, more um, economic uh, theories to look also into the, the costs. What cost will you make for your repatriation service? What cost will you make for the uh, reception agency? And also, what less costs will you have for your detention center? Uh, as many of you may know, um, I think we're the only country that closes um, uh, uh, detention facilities, and we even rent them out to uh, other countries like Belgium and Norway. And we also downsized our uh, uh, um, detention capacity for um, the detention for migrants. Um, but we did build a new location. Because the new location uh, only hosts about one family and one unaccompanied minor, we have chosen now also to use a part of the building uh, for the women in detention. And to give you an example, we have approximately 10 uh, women a month in detention in the Netherlands. So they have now two of the three, or three of the houses and they use that as the detention location. Um, but it, it has challenges into it because also how can we evolve further and we don't know where to go from here. What, uh, we're waiting for a new government so it's a bit difficult to see where we are going. Uh, but we did see that alternatives, you have to do it together and you ha also have to look into from the border uh, till return. It's not just one single fact. Um, you can do something during the procedure, but most important it is to look into how is someone arriving in the country and how do you want someone to return. 
Um, for us, durable returns are still the focus, and um, we prefer if people return voluntarily. And that's also one of the reasons I think we are I don't know if you're the last country, but we're uh, one of the few countries, even in attention, it's possible to go to IOM and get a return package for your return. Because we rather have someone, even in detention, say, okay, I need some help to get back, and also for NGOs to work into detention. So don't end the alternatives at the moment you have the detention and keep looking into the possibilities. I have detained someone, is it possible to use an alternative at the moment. We had some success with our bail program. That's not for families, but it's for uh, the, the adults. And we saw the uh, people in detention um, who never wanted to talk about an alternative then came to the um, a repatriation uh, service and said, okay, I don't want to be in detention. What do I need to do to get out? Um, and then you even then you have to consider, is an alternative possible? Uh, and that's difficult because there's always the risk to abscond. But as has been mentioned before, detention is not uh, a punishment. So don't use it that way and keep looking into the possibilities of a, a, a different measure as called an alternative. For us, the... Um, family location is a rather expensive solution. I know that's not possible in all the countries, but you can look into what is possible to lower the numbers of your detention or even make sure that you don't have uh, detention. I know when we started with the border uh, screening, everyone was saying, oh, there are gonna be a lot more of migrants coming through Schiphol and at the airport and looking into uh, re requesting asylum in the Netherlands because now they can walk into the country. Of course, there was an increase, but I think all European countries saw in 2015 and 16 an increase in the number of migrants. We didn't see an increase due to the fact that we have now a border screening. But that was for us also proof that it doesn't have to be a negative choice to go for an alternative. Um, I can't see any questions on Slido here yet, but if you have any questions or if you have any questions about financing, uh, please let us know. Um, and always, if you want to come to visit, let us know because we do, oh, thank you. Um, to me, and no detention for nine months, but didn't work. Was there an effective system of coaching and real inf investment in building trust in place? Um, I would say there was. Um, we have the repatriation service uh, who works on uh, a scientific approach uh, which is based on the case management. Um, they focus on the, the message is you have to work on return, but we can help you with that and we can help you in, uh, with all the aspects of that. The difficulty is uh, a lot of families with children know that they have the reception in the family locations and um, they, we have this system in the Netherlands that every couple of years there's a general rule that you will be excused that you haven't left the country and will get a permit, uh, we call it pardon. The, di the reason it didn't work for us was people would cooperate until the moment they would get the notification, in two days you will be uh, leaving the country. And I think it would be the stress reaction, but we, we looked into it with the Refugee Council and other NGOs. Um, it's something that suddenly it becomes real for people. And all this time it's like, oh, I have to go back to Armenia or other countries. It, it's not real until you get the notification. 48 hours, then the bus will arrive who will take you to the airport. So it's something we still look into from, can we change the, the effective system of coaching and um, how can the repatriation service and the NGOs get trust? Um, I saw another question. We have uh, many. 
I have many. Okay, then I will look But you have them. only 50 seconds. I have 50 <laughs> seconds. Um, I saw before the question if borders uh, uh, screening was successful. Our border screening is successful. It's done by our marechaussee, but I must say we have it easy because the Netherlands, uh, well, we have a very slight border from external EU, and that's only Schiphol uh, or one of the other airports. Um, and the border screening for us is very successful. It's just that we look into, okay, this is a family. Um, ca can they prove they are related? Or do they have the documents that they can travel with this child? And um, is there any involvement? Do we suspect that there is a possibility of war crimes? If all those answers are no, then the family is sent to an open reception location. So. Just over the time, I'm Thank sorry. Thank you very much, Irene. This was uh, a very honest presentation. <laughs> I think we all noted uh, not only that detention is last resort and that people are not in uniform and no handcuffs, that's all very nice. I hope you did take down, if you need to rent a detention center, call Irene. <laughs> uh, we have to move on. We'll get some more questions, I hope, a little bit of time at the end. Our fourth and last speaker for today is um, Robin, Robin Sampson. She is um, a researcher, uh, an academic, I suspect, and uh, as, we, as we will l uh, soon learn, uh, a recognized expert on alternatives. Um, she's written a handbook which is being used, and I'll I, I know only one secret about uh, Robin, so I'll immediately spread it. She's from Australia, so we <laughs> even have some Australian thinking into our conference. Um, Robin, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the organizers for including the IDC as uh, giving us an opportunity to speak uh, as we have mentioned, I am from Australia, but my role with the IDC is very international in nature, so although I won't be speaking about Australia today, you're welcome to ask me questions on that separately. So the IDC is the International Detention Coalition. We're a network of over 300 NGOs in 70 different countries around the world that all work with migrants or refugees and in some way find that detention is affecting the people that they work with. So we undertake advocacy to try and limit the use of unnecessary detention, to end the detention of children and to increase the use of alternatives. This includes working with governments such as the government of Mexico and it was very great to be able to share the stage here with um, Mr. Alamon and hear from his perspective. Um, I did my PhD on alternatives to detention in collaboration with the IDC and out of that research we published the handbook on alternatives called There Are Alternatives. <laughs> I'll just see how many times I can say the word alternatives. <laughs> uh, I'm now a staff member with the IDC. I was an academic for several years. I've now moved over to a different sphere in the world. And uh, my role there is to coordinate our research. And because I have um, done so much research on this topic, then I often take on a role as a, an advisor to governments and NGOs and stakeholders to try and help them um, consider what um, different approaches they could be taking to working with migrants who they might otherwise consider detaining. So the IDC has a global campaign to end child immigration detention, which uh, has just celebrated its fifth anniversary. And it's run by our coordinator, Leanne Torpy, who um, was not able to be here, but sends her best regards. I'm sure a number of you have met with her before. In Europe, obviously, we have the Council of Europe's um, parliamentary campaign to end the immigration detention of children. And I would like to take a moment just to commend all the members of the PACE committee for your interest, your actions, your passion for this issue uh, during the campaign to raise awareness of the fate of children held in immigration detention and to try and work to uphold their rights. 
I'd also like to note, as we heard this morning, the work of the Council's Steering Committee for Human Rights Drafting Group on Migration and Human Rights in preparing the analysis of legal and practical aspects of effective alternatives to detention. It's a very welcome development to have this kind of um, document prepared. Um, a lot of effort in this area to date has come from INGOs and NGOs, so it's wonderful to see the Council um, putting some resources behind trying to understand what makes effective alternatives. There is a real opportunity to expand alternatives to detention in Europe, especially by expanding the use of those that focus on engagement. For a long time, the focus in this region has been on what might be called the more traditional or enforcement-based alternatives to detention that are borrowed from the criminal justice system. These include restrictions and conditions that give governments a greater sense of control over certain actions and choices of individuals, but there's little evidence that restrictions in and of themselves are what promote case resolution and compliance with final outcomes. In Europe, there is a real scope and a need to shift the focus to understand and develop engagement-based alternatives that actually work to improve the effectiveness of procedures in both achieving case resolution and respecting rights and upholding migrants' well-being. So the examples I'll provide today do move beyond conditions to this range of factors. If we look at the growing body of international research, best practice and evidence, the most effective elements to manage people outside of detention and the, are those elements that engage migrants in immigration procedures, in particular through tailored case management. This involves a social work approach, empowering and building trust with migrants to work towards the resolution of their migration matter. Our own five-year program of research looked at well over 250 examples of alternatives to detention. I think actually I have probably more like 500 in my little <laughs> database on my computer uh, from over 60 countries and through um, integrating our understanding from all those examples have identified the key elements of successful alternatives. So we've found that alternatives that um, integrate these elements can achieve high compliance rates, high levels of case resolution and voluntary return at a fraction of the cost of detention, while of course providing a much more humane experience for the migrants involved. <clears throat> so why are engagement-based alternatives so effective? Well, we know from our research that migrants are more willing and able to comply with the negative outcome of their migration application or uh, protection application if they believe that they have been through a fair and efficient process, if they've been informed and supported through that process, and they've explored all the options to remain in the country legally. Alternatives that only focus on conditions and enforcement measures do not promote these kinds of outcomes. Instead, alternatives that engage with migrants to better understand their situation, that support migrants to meet their basic needs, and that inform migrants of all their options will produce much better results. So what are the alternatives? Uh, you can see on the screen a picture there of our handbook, uh, which includes our community assessment and placement model, or the CAP model. It's a tool for government, civil society, and stakeholders to build systems that ensure detention is only used as a very last resort and that community options result in the best outcomes possible. So it's our attempt to highlight um, um, what it is that can reduce the need for detention by improving the outcomes from community settings. First, I'd like to talk about prevention. In this case, I'd like to highlight the examples of countries with laws that have, uh, that have laws that prohibit the detention of children. 
A number of governments around the world now have these laws in place and they can be broken down. Obviously, the ideal would include the pro prohibition of the detention of all children and their families, such as in Ecuador. Um, and I've highlighted there that we've just published a briefing paper on this in June, which is available online if you're interested in looking at other country examples than those I highlight today. I've only picked examples from within the European context, but there are others from different regions as well. So some countries have laws that prohibit any detention of children. So in Ireland, this falls under two different sections of law. The first, which prohibits detention of children pending deportation, and the second prohibits the detention of children seeking asylum. In the case of Mexico, as we heard, they also have a law prohib prohibiting the detention of ch all children. In their case, that falls within their child rights legislation. We also have countries that have a prohibition on the detention of children who are in a younger age bracket. So in this example, a lip, a Latvia excuse me, does not allow the detention of minors under the age of 14. And there are a few other European countries with this kind of protection in place. Many countries have laws that prohibit the detention of unaccompanied minors. It's probably the, much, the most common um, prohibition that's in legislation around the world. For example, Italy does not allow unaccompanied minors to be held in detention. And in fact, the protections for unaccompanied minors were strengthened in March of this year in Italy through the Provision of Protection Measures Law, which was commonly called the Zampa Law. And this law systematizes the Italian approach to responding to unaccompanied minors through measures such as a structured national reception system. Finally, oh, excuse my formatting. We have unaccompanied minors who are seeking asylum. So uh, as you're all aware in Europe, uh, detention often is in two parts of the migration uh, sort of legislation, one asylum, one and deportation. And therefore it's possible to have just uh, children who are seeking asylum exempt from the detention relating to asylum seekers. And this is the case in the Czech Republic in which we are currently standing. Okay, I'd like to quickly mention the importance of screening. We heard this earlier from um, Antigone about the fact that screening was such a challenge initially in the context of Greece. And we do find that it's a very important measure that ensures authorities have actually identified children who are uh, within their purview, whether it's already in detention or in an intake situation, and that they take their situation into account. This is an important strategy for building trust in the system and being able to address the range of barriers that might impede case resolution. As we mentioned, as we saw this morning, we published with UNHCR a vulnerability screening tool, and I encourage you to look at that for more examples. I won't go into these procedures in detail now because there are some good examples elsewhere. I'd like to just take a moment to let uh, a member of the government, of uh, uh, the migration agency in Sweden, um, speak about their approach to um, alternatives to detention. So you have a little break from my voice. Thank you. So my name is Niklas Axelsson and I work with the Swedish Migration Agency. I'm so we have the cost to deprive someone of liberty. There's a financial cost, it's expensive to lock people up, uh, and also there's a humanitarian cost. It's very costly for the person who is detained from a humanitarian perspective. that there's a network of different stakeholders that are dealing with the best interest of the child. We have the, uh, the municipality who is responsible to make sure that everything is working with school, uh, housing, etc. We have the custodian who is the one who is, instead of the adult or the, the parent, the child is taking care of the best interest of the child. And we have the migration agency who is working with 
the uh, asylum application and is, who is dealing with the asylum process. Also, I think it's uh, important to have um, a holistic perspective on the process in order to make sure that we don't have any problems in such as supervision or detention. We really need to have a process that's uh, characterized by transparency and a good behavior, respectful behavior towards the applicant. I think if we do so, we also have a good opportunity to make sure that we don't have to use repressive means at all. Thank you. I'm sorry for the sound quality of the video, but I think the message is very important that there's such a commitment to uh, engagement-based alternatives rather than enforcement, even restrictions or conditions that might be used. So I'm going to speak now about a couple of the placement options. First, I'm going to talk about placement for unaccompanied minors, similar to what we heard in Greece. And there are uh, several options in terms of placement, including foster care, kinship care, small group homes, and reception centers. Uh, obviously, in the majority of cases, we would like to see children not housed in institutional settings, but in family-based care as much as possible. So I'm going to focus on two of these examples from foster care and kinship care. So I wanted to highlight um, uh, the example in Venice in Italy, but there are well-established foster care programs for unaccompanied minors in the Netherlands and the UK, which have some good write-ups available. Whereas in a lot of countries, foster care is only just being developed or is only being implemented in local government areas. And that's the case in uh, Italy. So in the region of Venice, they decided to invest in expanding the number of unaccompanied minors placed in foster care. Venice has been receiving unaccompanied minors since 1997. At the moment, they're mostly 16 and 17-year-old boys from countries like Bangladesh, Kosovo, and Afghanistan. And there are usually about 350 boys in the system at any one time. Initially, they were all placed in reception centers, and now about half of the intake live with foster families um, instead of reception. They have a procedure for trying to identify the best location for the child, which involves asking the child if they already have any networks in the local area, and uh, if not, whether in fact their family have connections that would be appropriate. If not, they're placed in residential care, but if a needs assessment undertaken and shows that the child would be best placed in a family setting, then a foster family is identified, and they are usually actually from the Italian community rather than the child's own cultural background. They decided to invest in the expansion of foster care because of their belief that family placement is a better environment for children. They also had noticed that many of the children had extended family already in the city and would prefer to live with them. Additionally, the law actually favours placement in a family setting, a foster family setting and they found that the accommodation costs were greatly reduced from using this option. Another example in Sweden is the use of kinship care. Kinship care is when a child is placed with members of their extended family or close family friends who are known to the child. So about 40% of these minors in Sweden are placed in kinship care, which was more than 1,500 children in 2015. And authorities undertake screening and assessment before the placement occurs. The advantages uh, shown through an evaluation were that the children do experience a much more stable placement, as well as having shared language and culture with the family who they lived with. The challenges can, or disadvantages is that the family can often be in the asylum process themselves, and so it ha comes with the attendant stresses, uncertainty, and uh, fewer economic resources. I now wanted to look at placement with conditions for families. So this is particularly for families in return procedures. I'm using the UK example because they have a very strong evaluation which helps us understand what's working and why. So in 2011, the UK introduced this family returns process and it places an emphasis on the need to safeguard and promote the well-being of children. It starts once a family has exhausted all their appeal rights. 
It starts uh, with a um, family removals conference. It's a first step in an escalating process. During this conference, their options and the consequences of their different choices are explored and they're then provided with information about the options and support available. The family has a week to consider what they will do and then they return for a family departure meeting where they state their intentions and start the next steps of the process. The first option in this process is assisted return where they can depart independently with or without support. I wouldn't call it voluntary return because there is some uh, level of coercion at this level, but there's certainly independent departure. The second option is required return where they are still able to self-check in at the airport, but they have removal um, directions imposed on them. The last option is insured return, which includes enforcement actions, but this can only be implemented after it's been referred to an independent family returns panel uh, with arguments for why this is necessary for this family. In 2011-2012, the program found that 51% of the families departed without enforcement actions. Um, and I think that in itself is a very strong outcome if you're thinking of halving the number of children who might otherwise face detention. But the good news is that they've continued to evolve and um, develop their their program and in the last evaluation, 2014-2016, which had more than 1,500 families departing the country, they actually had a phenomenal 97% rate of departure without any enforcement procedures required. As the evaluation found, the data reflects that more families are entering the family returns process and as a proportion, many more are returning to their country of origin without the need for an insured return. May I just quickly finish? I think we'll give you that. That permission, thank you. I got confused. Actually, I'm going to skip ahead then because I wanted to talk about this example from the US, uh, even though it's outside of Europe. Again, because it actually has some important um, evaluation data that's useful. So this uh, family return program ran from 20, January 2016 to June 2017, and it was designed to test the premise that by meeting needs and providing information, participants will be more ready, willing, and able to comply with all aspects of the immigration process. Upon entering the program, qualified case managers, most of whom were from a social work background, undertook an initial assessment with each family to identify their needs and concerns. They then developed a family case plan, including referral to required services, additional information, and monitoring. The uh, framework for engagement had three components. The first was that case managers worked with families so that they could access community services depending on their needs. The second is that they would provide orientation to the migration system and ensure that each family attended a Know Your Rights information session about the procedures they were involved in. Finally, monitoring would be tailored to each family depending on their circumstances, then undertaken by dedicated immigration officers. So together, these three components served as a method to promote compliance while allowing participants to remain in their community as they moved through the immigration process. So just to finish, uh, while there's been no formal evaluation, um, it was producing very strong results and uh, many were disappointed when it was closed by the new administration in June. But as of April 2017, the program had worked with more than 630 families. 99% had attended their court hearings and check-in appointments with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Anecdotal evidence suggested the pro program also produced independent departures when required and better coping and well-being outcomes for children and families. Overall, the program cost $36 per day per family compared with 164 US dollars per day per person should they have been in detention. And thank you for allowing me that extra time. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I think...
I think the participants were keen to uh, listen to. If I, we now have a number of questions, definitely your cost-benefit analysis in the end. Uh, but what I would like to underline, I haven't heard that much in this conference, but you said something extremely important to the Swedish colleague, respect to the applicant. Uh, that's quite often an, an issue which gets forgotten. So questions now, I think. We have, just that you know, unless you want to forfeit lunch, uh, which I don't think anybody wants to do, 20 minutes for questions. Uh, I recommend uh, I'll take a, a show of hands. And then we'll go, so you can prepare, we'll go through some of these questions that we have. Um, Noala, I haven't, if, she was very first because she asked me before the session. <laughs> Sneaky. Um, thank you very much, Aldrich. Uh, what I think I have found missing from the wonderful discussions we've had in these two days is uh, some lawyerly precision, and I would because I'm a lawyer. So can I just ask us and ask the panel to think about what is the detention that we're trying to eradicate? My understanding is that we are trying to eradicate detention under Article 5.1.F of the European Convention on Human Rights. That is, detention to prevent the effecting of an unauthorized entry or detention with a view to deportation. But I think we have to be very careful and precise about this and to be sure that we really know what we're asking for. Because if we say that we want to end the detention of all migrant children or end all detention of migrant children, do we really want to end detention technically classified as detention under Article 5.1b of the Convention, or more appropriately, the special detention of minors, which is authorised under Article 5.1d, which is specifically there to be in their interest. And I think we need to be very careful that we're not saying that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I hope the interpreters can deal with that uh, colloquialism. But I think we want to be very sure that we are addressing the detention that is the key, which is detention under 5.1.F. Uh, the other thing is I think we want to be sure that we're not at risk of adopting a definition of detention which also encompasses restrictions on freedom of movement, which might prove to be the key to alternatives to detention that this conference is exploring uh, these two days. And I think it's very important that we are aware of the difference between the two restrictions. And, and in particular, Frank Schurman, in his presentation this morning, referred to the case of uh, de Tomaso against Italy, which was recently decided by the Grand Chamber of the European Court, which I think should be required reading for everybody because it very clearly analyzes the difference between a deprivation of liberty and a restriction on freedom of movement and sets out what is and isn't permissible. And I would very much welcome all the experts on the panel response to the point I've raised. And thank you, Aldrich, for letting me raise it. I'm sure you would, Noel. I think as a lawyer, I appreciate your, your precision and, and questions extremely well. But I think the non-lawyers in this room don't like me uh, doing that. Uh, I think you've just given a subject for the next conference because um, I don't think we can deal with that and give it any justice uh, in the few minutes we have now. I, I, if somebody volunteers to answer that, uh, I'm fine, but then I see two more hands and then we've got some of the written questions. Robin. Thank you. Uh, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not from Europe, so I'm hoping I've understood uh, the specifics of your question um, without being familiar with the convention um, to the extent that you are for certain. Um, generally, the IDC would argue that uh, the form of detention we're trying to eliminate is deprivation of liberty uh, for reasons relating to a person's migration status. 
So it sounds like under this convention it is 51F. If there is a uh, 51F, excuse me. If there is a, an allowance for the deprivation of liberty of a child in their best interests in 51D, my, I'm assuming that is not for reasons relating to their migration status, but actually relating to their personal best interests, in which case it's a different form of detention to the one that we're discussing here. Um, and I'd also like to flag that I'm not quite clear on where Dublin uh, detention sits within these frameworks, whether people consider it part of the entry or whether it's a considered a part of a return procedure. But again, this would certainly apply to Dublin transferees as well. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I think that was a brilliant non-lawyer answer to a brilliant lawyer. Um, uh, I saw some other hands. Uh, oui, monsieur. Yes, thank you. Now, at the level of the Conference of NGOs of the Council of Europe, on the 27th of June, we organized a very topical debate on migration, and we asked the chair of Metra Dazi, Laura Papa, to come, and she spoke to us about the difficulty encountered by local associations to try to claim to be involved in calls for projects uh, launched by the EU, it's very difficult to, to respond to that in technical terms and therefore I believe that it is certain types of NGOs who can reply and when they do so, they in fact arrive in, on conquered territory uh, rather than involving the uh, social workers who are members of the local associations because they offer higher uh, salaries. They're Therefore, couldn't we try and simplify access uh, to local uh, NGOs to join these projects in order to uh, develop these promising uh, ideas or projects? Uh, thank you for the question, and I'm sorry I, I can't speak French in my reply. Um, the IDC is a network of NGOs around the world. And because of that, a lot of the projects that we support are being undertaken by NGOs who are based in the areas where, um, uh, in, in, at least in the countries and the local areas where migrants are most present in those countries. So from our point of view, although we might not be enabling all NGOs who have social work experience in, in, to become involved in the first instance, we're certainly very open in our membership and support whatever organizations are interested in expanding their um, support of, of work in this field. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, referring to what Ms. Papa and Matadrasi has been uh, supporting during, uh, especially um, with the opportunity of, of uh, the refugee crisis in Greece, was that we had to have intermediaries uh, international NGOs to be able to have access to funding such as ECHO. So, so the, the idea was for uh, international organizations or organizations that um, manage funds to always, have, um, to always have into mind that funding should be open to local organizations that have the social capital, which also decreases the number of funds required if you don't have somebody who is managing the management of funds. I don't know if you, if you understand what I mean. But that, that was the idea behind this suggestion, that we would have to go, for instance, through Save the Children or through the IRC to be able to access funds. Why, why we could be doing the job ourselves, we just didn't have the possibility to apply. So that was the idea. Is that all right? Does that reply suffice? I saw a hand. Uh, introduce yourself, please. Thank you. I am Kirsten Sandberg. I, I was on the floor yesterday. Um, I have a question to, to Ms. Rittman, which is quite uh, short, I think. Um, what is the maximum duration of, uh, of uh, detention in relation to return? I, I didn't catch if you said it, but I, I have a, a, two other points. The second one is, uh, Ms. Sampson, I would like you to comment on the return detention uh, in Holland, uh, in Netherlands, and, and uh, how possibly they might deal with that, because I can understand the, the difficulties that uh, the Dutch government is seeing. 
Um, but I also, that's my third point, I wanted to take the floor in support of the UN Global Study that was mentioned in the session before, uh, because I was a bit sorry that nobody took the floor in support of it and, and the moderator didn't see my hand. Uh, this uh, um, proposal was adopted by the United Nations um, General Assembly, it's almost two years ago, and uh, Manfred Nowak, who is an excellent expert on human rights and uh, international law, has agreed agreed to be the, the international expert for this study and it's really, really necessary to have this study undertaken in order to, to look into everything concerning deprivation of liberty of children worldwide. Uh, we had the global study on violence against children which was ready 10 years ago and it has had an immense impact. So it's really high time that we get the same kind of global study on deprivation of liberty of children. And I think it's very timely to mention it in this respect. And there, is, there are very few states so far that have actually uh, supported it financially. We have Switzerland, I think Austria, uh, and a few other states. But it's really, this is really to encourage states to support this global study. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like, love to see. I would love to see Manfred Novak in charge of that. Um, uh, who would like to respond from the panel, please? Um, the maximum duration uh, for detention is two weeks in the Netherlands, but that's the maximum. On average, it's six days. Very good. Um, I don't see any hands. We have 12 minutes, 46 seconds running to lunch. Uh, yes, sorry, I missed you. Uh, the question from the floor asked me to respond to the challenges in the Netherlands. Um, one point I didn't make in my presentation is that the kinds of examples I was describing are not just uh, cut and paste. You can't just lift one from one country and put it in another without adapting to the specific populations and systems in that country. So in a broad way, I'm just laying the ground that um, I haven't actually been able to um, look at the case of the Netherlands in great detail myself. Um, I would be confident that we could find some ways to help improve the outcomes for families from a community setting. Uh, because we have seen such great outcomes in other countries and contexts and um, given the, the um, similarities uh, in a broad sense between Netherlands and say the UK in the sense they're both broadly destination countries etc then I would think there's some learnings we could probably um, adapt to that situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Can I throw to the panel what we have on the screen? I know it's a big subject, but maybe in a few words. Local politicians easily label migrants as danger. This is how they justify detention. How can states counter this narrative? I apologize, it's a big one, but... Uh, one of the main focuses for the Netherlands was it's either administrative detention or you go to the criminal detention. Don't mix those two up. And um, if uh, a migrant has committed an offense or misdemeanor, then there's the criminal law. That's not the administrative detention. And keep those two separate. Be sure to keep those two separate in every communication. Um, because the moment you, you mix those two, then you go back to um, migrants as danger, as criminal, and that's not why you want the detention or why you want detention to be used. In Mexico, um, migratory issues are not a uh, criminal offense, it's an administrative procedure, and uh, we have clearly defined the um, difference between one thing and the other. Um, we don't think that the migration had, uh, have a um, danger because uh, we know uh, very well that the migration of the main flow of the people uh, traveling from Mexico is uh, uh, because the 
people have the the necessity to to obtain better condition of uh, in, in its life and uh, that's all that took us back nicely to humanism and uh, the ideals of humanism I'm, uh, anybody else wants to respond from practice because it is a difficult abusable issue uh, if not hands no hands how about to Robin have you uh, uh, seen this question how does IDC distinguish between good and bad ATD practices are there practices the IDC considers alternative forms of detention uh, I'd be happy to take that thank you um, I might start with the second part of that first. We certainly uh, try to distinguish between alternatives to detention and uh, alternative forms of detention. As an example, uh, we consider the use of electronic ankle bracelets an alternative form of detention because we believe the imposition on people's freedom of movement is so significant it amounts to a similar level of deprivation of liberty. Um, importantly, as part of that is the fact that people have to plug their ankle bracelet into the wall for so many hours in a day, as well as be within certain um, a realm of their, their home base um, uh, for, for set periods of the day. So the combination of factors um, has, has uh, meant that we've made that um, call uh, also, with other forms of, um, uh, say, forms of reception that amount to a deprivation of liberty, we would consider a, a form of detention as well. Um, there are, of course, these sort of grey areas where, for instance, if a reception centre is technically one where people can come and go as they like, but it's in an extremely remote part of the country, which is particularly the case, uh, could be the case in such a large country as Australia, but it's still the case in much smaller countries as we have in Europe, then, uh, and there's very little access to, say, public transport or no funds available for people to pay for public transport, then you come into a grey area where, uh, I mean, the IDC as an organisation has not made a call on that particularly, but it's certainly something that we would um, be very wary of. So I guess that partly perhaps distinguishes between good and bad. It's, we're not a black and white kind of <laughs> organisation, um, but we would certainly um, always take the impact on the person as the best way to understand whether it's the best practice that could be applied or not in that individual case. Thank you, Robin. I'm just looking for guidance to the organizers. My watch says zero minutes, five. Very good. Then I would go ahead and um, we've got nine thumbs up on how, how do we get the funding for alternatives to detention, how to persuade those in charge of the budget. Any ideas on that? Um, we've actually seen this happen uh, for the transit shelters for children in the islands. Uh, we were trying to convince all types of donors, institutional ma uh, mainly, back in 2015. And back then, nobody was interested in the rights of children. Uh, so the, the, the answer was that right now, unaccompanied children uh, are not a priority. So uh, what we did, and of course you, you need to have some capacity to do that, is to try to identify uh, alternative sources of funding private donors uh, try to, you know, share the idea with somebody that has the resources, make something work, and then ask uh, for funds for its continuation. So when you prove that something is working, when you prove that something is efficient, and uh, you show to the donors, even institutional, that this is some, something that is actually worth funding, then you can, uh, you can persuade them to change. Uh, their funding preferences. 
thank you. Can I abuse my position of a moderator? What do you do with a donor after three or four years when the donor says, we've given you enough money, it's not a priority for, you've got the same problem still, you haven't got domestic funding. What do you do after three or four years when the project is no longer the flavor of the month? You try to find the alternative donors. I mean, you have to try to diversify the, the people from whom you're requesting money. So somebody will be interested. You just have to find them. On that optimistic note, um, we still have time. Anybody else want to answer on funding? If not, we have child-friendly information on rights and procedures can be a tool to help children to understand. Ideas or experiences from the panelists for this problem? Who volunteers? Uh, so, of course, child friendly information is very important on rights and procedures. Uh, children need to understand the different options they have, but for us, it's not, it's not only information, uh, it's, it's the building of a relationship of trust between the people that provide the information and, and the children. So it's, it's not so much how you provide the information, but it's who is providing the information. We've seen that in, in the Greek context, let's say uh, UNHCR, you know, they, they have all the goodwill and providing information, but from some point on, they, the, the reality was canceling what, what, the, uh, what they were saying. So what is most important is that you, you build a relationship of trust with the children and the children will, will hear you and will trust what you have to say and to let them know that you know, the, the information that you're providing them with is subject to different conditions and might change. The content of information might change from day to day. I mean, we had, we had the reality with the Idomeni. People, 7,000 persons would pass per day would cross the border. And in one day, it stopped. That, that did not mean that the, the information that, for instance, UNHCR was providing was false, but the conditions changed. Yes, Hector. We must not uh, forget that uh, one of the um, rights of the childhood is uh, the information. And, uh, we are trying to, to give the information, the correct information on, uh, to the children in any moment. We have implemented some uh, projects to um, supply this, this information with the um, coordination with UNICEF, for example. And we have a, um, a figure in, in our institution named it, uh, Officers for Protection to Childhood, um, OPIS, we, we know like OPIS that uh, bring company to the, to the children all the, um, the time that during their procedures. And we think that these are good practices. Thank you very much, Hector. I think, um, uh, I think it's, I'll make a little short announcement announcement at the very end. I think it's time for me to wrap up and uh, to ask you to thank the panelists, Hector, Ant uh, Anticona, Irene, and Robin. I think we got a few answers, good answers to good questions. Um, I think it was impressive. This is a subject which will not go away quite evidently, and it needs a lot of goodwill. And I'm glad to see that a lot of uh, people with goodwill both from governments and from NGOs and international NGOs have come here to find the best way forward. 